Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. Matt Adele, when he's not killing 80,000 zombies or adopting dogs, is launching companies. This former CEO of Beatport is now trying to change the way we license and remix music through Metapop, but also joined us at our podcast to share his past adventures, current perspectives, and future areas of excitement in music. My, my new venture is a company called Metapop. And uh, after Beatport, which I'll tell you a little bit more about that transition later, but after Beatport, I took some time off. According to my Xbox, I killed about 80,000 zombies. Oh, cool. And uh, then I adopted two new troubled dogs and spent some time helping them acclimate. And then I got back to thinking about what I wanted to do next. And I knew that I wanted to solve an intractable problem problem. Uh, I, th- I feel like in the music space, a lot of uh, people tend to confuse innovation with disruption a lot. And I, I love seeing that you, you talk about innovation here because I don't like the phrase disruption. Mm-hmm. Burning down this building would be a disruption. Um, disruption to me is not it, it necessarily a good thing. Innovation in my mind is something that moves moves things forward in, okay. a, in a positive way for whomever the constituencies are. Disruption to me usually breaks something for one set of constituents and creates new profitability for another set of constituents. Or it's almost a subset of innovation. It is. It's, it's a type yes, of crazy. It's, yes, it's a type of innovation, absolutely. Uh, but in, in the history of, of music, a lot of disruption has been bad for the music business, bad for creators, bad for consumers. So I thought a lot about what I learned while I was at Beatport and where I thought that there was money being left on the table for creators and and rights holders, the the people who represent creators, publishers, and labels. And at Beatport, we had this really cool uh, platform for remix competitions where uh, aspirational creators could come and download stems for free and then participate in a competition where the winner or winners would win some hardware, some software for their home studio, and a commercial release of their remix. And get visibility, too. Get, uh, absolutely. Zed, uh, who has produced Lady Gaga, um, and uh, I think Aloe Black is does that M&M's commercial with him. But uh, Zeb was discovered uh, after winning two Beatport remix contests over three months while still living with his parents. Oh, wow. And less than a year later, he was producing a Lady Gaga track. Uh, so I love that platform. I love aspirational creators and the enthusiasm they bring. And what we noticed was uh, at any given moment, only about 10% of the people who would come and download the stems would actually participate in the competition. And, I mean, that makes sense to me. Whenever I see stems being offered for free, I download them, whether I'm going to, and I'm not. not To have this lovely inventory of fabulous riches. I'm hoarding them. And uh, also, I wasn't so into the competition thing. I just like to make stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What we noticed was if only about 10% of the people who came to download the stems for a competition were actually uploading to the competition, on maybe double that number were in fact doing remixes. They just weren't putting them into the competition platform. They were simply uploading them to YouTube and SoundCloud. And if you can take a second, not everyone listening is going to know what the heck a stem is. Oh, sure. A stem is a version of the multi-track master. Um, A stem is uh, multi-track masters sort of jammed into uh, 8 to 12 channels. Mm-hmm. So even if the the original recording was 48 channels, uh, someone condenses all the drums over in one place, all the melody in another place. Um, uh, if it was a, a traditional rock or indie band, you're going to put certain frequencies in each stem, but it's, it's a bundle of sounds from the recording that you can use to create your remix. So you've got the separated vocals, the separated bass line, things like so that. So it is an entire separated series or it's just one of the chunks? It's, uh, uh, it's usually eight, eight different channels of audio. Uh, one's the bass, one's the vocal, 
Uh, you'll have a melody. You'll have secondary drums. You know the main loop, what have you. Different different artists and different types of music have a tendency to organize that differently. And if people are curious, you know they can just go Google um, stems right now, and there's a whole site that explains this format. So before you started having this competition, people were doing ecosystem stuff of trading stems on their own, but they weren't necessarily getting visibility. Yeah, I mean, people have been doing remixes forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a kid in the 80s, you know, uh, a bootleg remix was, you know, someone chops up a public enemy record with a soft sell record. We call those mashups now. They didn't have that word then. Mm -hmm. And you press them on vinyl. And because they were illegal, uh, people did, frequently didn't put their name on them. So it might be a way to get a cool piece of vinyl out to your DJ friends, but it wasn't really a way to break your career. Yeah. Um, with Safe Harbor Law, which is the law that allows YouTube and SoundCloud to not get sued when you do something illegal and upload it, um, that barrier to entry broke down. You didn't have to. You could make one of these things, and you didn't have to press vinyl, and you could upload it under your own YouTube or SoundCloud name, and in theory, you couldn't get sued for doing that. If you sold it, you could get sued. Um, but if you just put it on these UGC platforms, effectively those platforms are responsible for uh, your use of someone else's copyright material. It's a lovely DMCA challenge. Yes, which I do not, I'm not a fan of. Okay. Uh, but it is what it is. I also, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about the weather either. And I, I see it similarly. So you looked at this challenge and the opportunity from having this competition at mm -hmm. Beatport and then looked at what you could do as this intractable problem? Mm-hmm. And so we built technology that I had, the, well, so I had this sense that a lot of these remixes were getting made, put on YouTube and SoundCloud, and they weren't being monetized properly. Uh, they were neither being taken down by anti-piracy efforts, which frankly don't interest me either as a creator or as a business person, uh, but they weren't getting claimed and monetized effectively. And in some cases, you have some of these remixes getting millions of plays mm -hmm. on YouTube. And at that point, it's real money. Yep. Um, or even if you're talking 10,000 remixes of Pale Shelter by Tears for Fears, which I remember working on, um, not one of them got a million views, but in aggregate, they got millions of views. And that's, again, it's real, it's real money. And the people who invested in that record and the people who poured their heart and soul into creating that record deserve the, the money. And if they don't get to claim it, if they don't claim it properly, um, no ads run in front of it. Uh, but YouTube is still, Google's still making money. You know, they make money just ha by having content on their platform. And I'd rather see more money go to creators. So we built some technology that basically scraped YouTube and SoundCloud to help us identify where are all these derivative works. And the, after we got the data back, we had the be, the, what we think is the best index of where all these derivative works are on YouTube and SoundCloud. Um, that index alone probably would have made a pretty interesting short-term anti-piracy business. Or just claiming your stuff right now. I mean, well, and yes, yeah. and that's what we're there to do is help people claim their stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to see the stuff taken down. Um, I don't think that that's productive at this point in time. And in fact, what I've seen is, since a lot of young people don't seem to really understand or care about copyright law, um, what I've seen is stuff gets taken down off of YouTube and SoundCloud. The next thing you know, it's on Bandcamp and the kid's selling it. Mm -hmm. You know, So uh, it, you're better off leaving it at YouTube than pushing someone to the outer fringes of monetizing their bootlegs. Well, but in, in the case of Bandcamp, they get their own data. They know who the who is coming in versus the data being mysteriously of who your fans are in the world of YouTube. That's true, um, but not the person who wrote the original song. That's true. Um, and what I've learned is remixers really, they don't really do it for money, they do it for audience, right? They wanna reach people with their creativity. And they chose to remix a famous song because they wanna piggyback on the SEO value of that famous song um, and, and get exposure that way. So and having it tucked in Bandcamp doesn't live that dream. No, it yeah. doesn't. Um, it's, a, it's a B plan. Yeah. And so we we decided our focus was going to be what I would call the single song remix. We looked at mashups, um, and what we found was there are a few superstars in the mashup world, like DJ Earworm, who I actually went to high school with. And, and uh, where was that? Evanston, Illinois. Evanston, Illinois. Uh, where Northwestern is. And uh, But Jordan, Earworm's an edge case. Really, there's no one else like him mm -hmm. who gets 50 million views a year making these incredible mashups. 
Uh, and so what we noticed is the most common type of derivative work in this space is the single song remix. Someone got the stems to Daft Punk, they remix it, sometimes well, sometimes not so well, they upload it and they communicate to their friends and social network, I just remixed this Daft Punk record, come listen to it. And then they literally sit there and stare and watch the engagement number on SoundCloud or YouTube for the two hours after they upload it. I mean, that's the most exciting two hours someone, a bedroom producer really gets is watching the play count go up, you know, right after you share it. So uh, Metapop is a new venture. We formally launched at the beginning of this year. The, the platform actually launched uh, in March. The MVP, the minimum valuable product, as we would say in startup world. In, in lean startup mode yes. methodology. And uh, we have been signing labels. Uh, we've signed, I think, about 5,600 independent labels since March. Wow. Um, and we help them manage uh, these remixes. Uh, in some cases, uh, the the labels and the music they've had before is popular enough that there's already a lot of remixes out there. And in some cases, we're working with labels, including jazz and country labels. To inspire it. To inspire great remixing and help them earn more revenue that way as well. There are some artists who aren't comfortable with remixing. I understand that. That's, that should be their prerogative, although Safe Harbor doesn't quite allow for that. Um, so it's a, it's a voluntary ecosystem. A label might choose to work with us on their entire catalog. Some labels have uh, chosen to do one-offs with us with new releases. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're getting closer and closer to working with the major labels by doing sort of one-offs with them. We did our first program with Universal uh, about six weeks ago, and um, we've got other major label stuff coming up that will be sort of one-at-a-time sort of things as opposed to the entire uh, bodies of their work. So the revenue side of this is advertising. Is well, the rev we so at, at one one level, our my business is really simple. We take fifteen percent of every dollar that flows through, and it doesn't matter to us whether that was a purchase revenue, so or an ad revenue or subscription revenue. The first thing we do is we monetize YouTube and SoundCloud, and the way we operate is any remix made from the catalog that we've licensed is pre-approved for distribution and monetization on SoundCloud and YouTube. The remixer doesn't have to submit it and hope someone likes it. The only time we will reject something, and we actually, this has never come up, but I had to draw, I wanted to draw the line somewhere, we will reject hate speech mm. uh, or commercial speech. If Donald Trump wants to make a theme song. This could be listened to any point in time, so this could be listened to before or after the election. All uh, right. Um, but if, thank you, but if so, if, <laughs> if uh, a political candidate or the Illinois Nazi Party wanted to make a remix, we won't let them do that. If Coca Cola wants to make a commercial, we won't let them do that. Either one of those are outside of our realm. Um, uh, uh, they should call the label and do their own direct deal if they want. But uh, that's never come up. Um, so the ideal being that creators know that if they spend time making a remix, it will see the light of day. And then, once those remixes have been claimed and monetized on the UGC platforms, mm -hmm. like SoundCloud and YouTube, we work with the labels to upstream the best of them to the commercial platforms. And we think this is really important because I'm sure, as, as you and your listeners probably know, the per stream payout from the UGC networks, YouTube and SoundCloud, is very low. And while sound, while say Spotify isn't, you know, winning any awards from the artist community, it is substantially higher on a uh, per stream basis. So we've cleared about 2,500, maybe 3,000 remixes mm -hmm. since March on the UGC platforms. And about 10% of those have been upstream to the commercial platforms. And we feel like that's really exciting for both parts of our ecosystem, the creator now has a real commercial release mm -hmm. of their remix, you know, that, uh, that they, they didn't know they would get. And uh, the, the tracks are now on a more profitable platform. And are you playlisting there as well so that there's a curated opportunity? We are just or? starting. We are just getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Uh, we just hired a young person to do that. A young person. And <laughs> um, uh, the uh, revenue that flows from any of those platforms. Any of them comes through us. Uh, seven, and this is true of every single track, every single deal, we're a non-negotiable platform. I think it's why we're scaling so fast. 70% mm -hmm. uh, goes to the original rights holders. 
fifteen percent to the the new remixer, and we keep fifteen percent. So, how did you get to all of this? I mean, when you were a whippersnapper yourself, what, a young person, mm-hmm. young person. Yeah. Uh, how did how did you end up walking this trail to get to this innovative spot? Because you've got some pieces of the puzzle along the way. I um, started working at a record store when I was fourteen uh, in Evanston, Illinois, and uh, always loved music. I'm a huge music fan, but. I, I've always taken great pleasure in helping someone find a record they like. I learned this from this guy, Rick Addy, who's retired now, and I was lucky enough to see this week as he was on his way to Old Cella. He was the manager of the record store at the time. And he was, you know, much younger than I am now, looking back and in bands and, you know, doing what people at record stores do. Uh, I'll leave everyone's imagination to that. And uh, But Rick loved customers at the record store, and he was really nice to all of them. And he taught me that if someone likes a record, that's a good record. And I genuinely believe that. Life is hard. Uh, People have kids to take to soccer practice. They have bills to pay that they can't afford. And if a record that I don't like makes them happy, then I like that record. Uh, I've always felt like as long as it's not hate speech, I feel okay about it. Um, And so having grown up in that record store environment, I think gave me a really interesting perspective. I don't come from a music, music criticism, you know, background. Uh, I come from this background of getting people the record they want. Mm-hmm. And so I worked in record stores uh, in college, started working at a, a punk rock independent label in the late 80s. Then I returned to Chicago and was lucky enough to start in the shipping department and less than a year later be the vice president at a record label called Wax Tracks Records in oh, Chicago. Yeah which is uh, you know, happening around, around the same time of the birth of techno in Detroit and house music in Chicago was industrial music, you know, com- which was coming out of a combination really of Belgium and Chicago. Uh, worked with bands like Ministry and Thrill Kill Cult and KMFDM. And uh, I got an incredible education there. Uh, the way I moved out of the warehouse to the front office was uh, I was able to see on the statements that I was given that said what what stuff to put in the box mm-hmm. and ship to what record store, right? And I could see that it seemed to me that we were selling some products for less than they were costing to make, which doesn't work very well, right? You don't unless you're Walmart, right? And selling other stuff, right? Right? Yeah, that yes, and we were in a foot traffic business, right? Yeah. Um, and so I brought this to the attention of the owner, and apparently I was the first person who'd ever tried to do a profit and loss statement on any of the products. And this was a $10 million a year company, you know, at the and time. And when was this? 88, 89. I was 21. Uh, and then, you know, for better or for worse, for worse in some ways, I became sort of the, the head of business guy at this label at that age. And it was an incredible, incredible education. Eventually, like many indie labels, the worst thing that can happen is you have huge hits. Mm. Um, uh, because then all of a sudden your cash flow management becomes really challenging because back then you had to manufacture right. stuff and it had to sit in the warehouse. And then you've manufactured all this stuff, you've got this huge investment in a band, and the band is so big the major labels come and poach them. Um, and that was happening to Wax Tracks. Eventually the right thing to do is to sell Wax Tracks to a bigger company. Uh, which was a good exit for the owners, Jim and Danny. They were great guys. And by that time, they were both ill. Um, so also for the families, it was, a, it was a good time to to let go. Uh, and then... But to be a VP in your 20s then or whatever, to be acquired? Yeah, it was was good for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it didn't make me... It made me rich with insight, I would say. And then I, uh, then I went to start my own label. I started a house label in Chicago. Um, I've, uh, I had developed a really serious interest in psychedelic music. Um, I found house and techno and industrial to be just as psychedelic as a Grateful Dead and, uh, um, fell in love with house music, fell in love with, uh, uh, this great guy, Derek Carter, who's one of the early house music people in, in Chicago, started a label to put out his records. Um, and that was hard. 
uh, manufacturing 12 inches vinyl, shipping them out of, out of my apartment basement at the end of every day. I'm uh, proud of what we got done. We put out about 30 records. Um, some artists made a living off of it at the time. Uh, but it was tough living for me. I remember I smoked at the time, and I remember counting how many cigarettes you know I could smoke at what times of the day because I I just couldn't afford because I was say, broke. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, in those days, when you 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 would man you you would manufacture a record with your money, you would ship that record to a distributor of record stores, and th theoretically they were supposed to pay you in sixty days. So under best case circumstances, you've spent money and you're hoping to get paid for it 90 days later. In reality, frequently they would pay you 120 or 200 days later. And only when you had the next thing coming up the pike. Exactly. They needed, yep. uh, if you didn't have a new record they wanted, they wouldn't pay you at all. And then sometimes they would misorder. They'd say, this is a great record, we're going to sell a ton of them. And when you're waiting for a check and you'd actually get 10 boxes of records back instead. Um, so cash flow management was the entire thing. It was a tough business. Uh, very different than it is now. Uh, it's still tough to be an indie label. It's just tough in different ways. And then uh, the internet happened. Burned uh, internet? Uh, my guy who was my lawyer and is still a very close friend. He lives in L.A. now as well, but I was still in Chicago at this time. He went to work for Motorola, uh, working um, as a, an in-house lawyer at a startup. Motorola, you know, Motorola means car radio. They Motorola were the car radio manufacturer when radios were first put into cars. And so Motorola was investing in early internet radio technology. And I worked at a place where we built uh, private label radio stations online. Uh, we were one of the first places to do it really, really early. Um, the company at the time actually held the patent to a buy now button um, where while you were listening to the music, if you hit buy now, you know, you would order the CD or, or what have you. Someday they're going to come and force that patent on everyone. And I loved it. I instantly loved the internet. And the reason I did was the first time I got a report that showed me that people were tuning out during a Madonna song. Tuning it, out. Tuning out. And it's not that I, I mean, I, I think Madonna's fine. I actually, I remember it was Justify My Love. I like that record. Um, but I knew that it was causing tune outs. And to me, that was like watching a dance floor while you're DJing, right? While you're DJing, you watch the dance floor because if people leave for the bar uh, and you didn't mean to be bringing down the energy, then you know you've done, done something wrong. But the feedback that you hadn't had earlier, to be able to actually see how to then counter-program, react, yes. thread. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was my first foray into like really professional music programming, mm -hmm. you know, if you will. And I loved it. I love, because again, I'm all about what people like, and if they're tuning out, well, I won't play that. I'll play something else. And then we started to build private la label stations for Blue Node and Ozzy what Osbourne. What company was this? That this was a company called Radio Wave. Oh, that was okay. owned almost entirely by Motorola. I think there were some other investors you know, later on. And then that ended around the time of um, the World Trade Center attack. Uh, then I was at a place called Music Now, which was the first music subscription service a la spotify and and everything everything else um did that for a while it was a great education it was too early music subscription didn't matter until smartphone penetration happened and yet everybody at that time knew that in their own way they oh yeah have, you know listen.com initially and all mm -hmm. the different folks who are early on in this space yep. where they saw the writing on the proverbial wall but were very early into the dance Yes, and you know, on the internet, actually, first doesn't win. Uh, later and better always wins. Uh, Amazon was not the first bookseller online. Google definitely not the first search engine. Right, exactly. Great point. And uh, so I don't begrudge Spotify for their success at all, uh, but effectively these services, these music subscription services, are commodities. They all have mostly the same catalog, uh, with very few exceptions. Uh, We're doing this recording on the day that Amazon came out finally with yes. their with their mm -hmm. new platform, which is definitely not their first one out of the gate. Yes, uh, seven ninety nine. They got the price down to four prime subscribers. Right. So right. We'll when you listen to this later, you might go, "Yes, we know that that this um, ended up being a, a big success or failure." We don't know at this point in time. But something insane, coming. like fifty percent of all people who have shopped on Amazon in the country are prime members. It's insane. And they say at an event I was at, again, I'm setting the time here, though, but, um, but one of their heads of data architecture spoke at UCLA this past week and said that um, 
more than 50% of online shopping now starts at Amazon. Oh, yeah. So I get it. we are being trained, right? Yes. But then you started with, you know, how we were being trained and looking about this. So how did that end up you being at Beatport? And, mm-hmm. and Beatport really was an interest, is an interesting company in mm-hmm. an interesting space. Well, eventually I was at Napster, legal Napster, I this like to remind Napster people. Napster part two. Yes, they're on part five, I think now. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had sold it to Best Buy. Uh, and nothing against Best Buy, but the first time I saw uh, my paycheck with a big, you know, corporate Best Buy check, because I was still getting checks, I immediately thought to myself, oh, it's time to go do something else. Uh. And also, once you sell a company, the uh, culture changes to match the culture of the new company. And the Best Buy people were very nice, but I didn't want to live in Minneapolis, which is where management is. Um, and it was just time to move on. And uh, one day I got a call from a headhunter. The first thing the headhunter said was, I've got this job opportunity, but first let me ask you, would you ever consider living in Denver? And I said, I have I would only consider living in Denver to work for a company called Beatport. Turns out that's where they were calling from. Uh, and Beatport at the time, uh, you know, I had I, dance music in my heart from when I was growing up, but I had gone more towards sort of the mainstream uh, area in my work. Uh, and, but Beatport, I knew it as the most important digital record store for DJs in the world. Or possibly the only one at the time? Um, no, there were a bunch of competitors that no one cared about. Okay. I mean, Beatport, you know, and, and, well, and Beatport I, I want to take that a... back. It's not that no one cared about it. There's actually a bunch of great stores that specialize in slightly different things. Mm-hmm. Like Track Source was always there, and they are just house music, mm-hmm. period. Um, Beatport was sort of brought, was meant to be broader for any electronic music DJ, not wedding DJs, you know, we weren't selling um, Celebration, you know, over and over again. And so I went to work there. The founders uh, were three DJs from Denver. And uh, they'd grown this amazing business to over $20 million in a handful of years. And they, it was time to sort of take the company to the next level. They had, they had raised some money from venture capitalists. And this was a funny transition in my life. Everywhere else up until that point, I was the nutty music young person, you know, within a corporate environment. And I went to Beatport to be the grown-up. Uh, and so that was a funny transition. Uh, so learned, how old were you when you then decided you were the grown-up here? Well, I didn't decide. They decided. They decided. Um, I was in my mid-30s. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, the listeners can't see me, but, you know, I'm tattooed, I'm pierced. And at that time, you I still... You look ageless. You <laughs> and at that time, age. I had very long hair. Mm-hmm. Um, and my head can't maintain that anymore. So <laughs> I, I went to work there, and um, the uh, founders all left to do other things. Um, one of them went to found a new company. One of them became a superstar DJ. One of them went back to run his incredibly successful ad agency in Denver, uh, which had always, you know, always been his first business. And I stayed. I became the CEO. We uh, pretty much doubled, well, more than doubled revenue over a period of years. Uh, but the company had taken venture capital money. And which demands growth. It, it not only demands growth, it demands a sale. Mm-hmm. That there is an exit at the end of it. Yes. I as hadn't really as, thought of that in this conversation. As soon as you take venture capital money, you are promising to sell the company. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's got to be an exit strategy that's yeah. a liquidity event. Uh, and so that became my job, uh, was to find that event for Bport and their shareholders. And we spent, once we decided we were prepared to do that, we had the... the Finances of the company were in order. All the trajectories of things were pointing in the right directions. Profitability was growing. Um, Once we felt like we had all our ducks in a row to have a good exit, then we spent about a year and a half creating that exit. And we ended up selling to a company called SFX, which is in the news today because it's going to climb out of bankruptcy um, supposedly in two or three weeks. We sold it to SFX. Uh, they were rolling up dance music properties. They bought uh, festivals. festivals, smaller promotion companies, a few other tech companies, but Beatport was really the hub of their, their digital strategy. Um, as was required of me, I worked for them for a year. Uh, I liked some of the people there, um, but basically sat on my hands for a year while SFX took over. Uh, I didn't want to move to New York. Uh, which was, again, 
someone buys it. They wanted me to move to New York. I'm really glad I didn't um, because <laughs> they went bankrupt. But uh, Buying I think things fairly pricey. Yeah, but he had done it successfully before. Absolutely. Um, and he's a Wall Street kind of finance person, and I'm not, and, you know, but whatever. Um, I did think it was funny to roll up EDM. Could you imagine if you and I were having a conversation now about rolling up grunge and how dumb that would sound? And Depends on when that was. Uh, it, Taking somebody's money to roll it up might have, mm, but there wasn't enough to roll. No, right. Yeah, and yeah. genres change. Yeah. And EDM, electronic dance music is a, is a fundamental shift in music culture, music creation and distribution. Uh, EDM is a genre. So, uh, you know, I would have focused on rolling up the, the changing means of production, the changing means of distribution, not the genre. Uh, because that's... Well, in many ways, yeah. you're doing that now. Then you are yes. building a, a new piece, not rolling up existing, yes. but rolling up what can be then under many different ecosystems of music. Yeah, we're a right. You know, we want Metapop to be a rights management system for derivative works, um, and we want to help everybody: Spotify, Apple, recording artists, aspirational remixers, publishers. Uh, to uh, benefit from this behavior of people making remixes without permission. Well, normally in these interviews, I ask about innovation. You have had that in all the pieces of our conversation so <laughs> far, what innovation is and isn't and, and elements of it. Uh, and we've talked about then roll-up versus drive to change. What has been your biggest challenge then in being an innovator and especially in music? Well... well I think by definition, if you want to innovate something, if everyone agrees with you, well, then it's probably not an innovation. So uh, uh, trying to get out in front of things. You know, and at Beatport, um, you know, I didn't found it. I didn't launch it. You know, some other guys were the guys who saw that opportunity first. I just made the most of that opportunity that they laid the groundwork for. Um, but with Metapop, it's, a, it's a fascinating, actually, because when I first started thinking about it, uh, I went to all my friends at the major labels. And I wanted them to know what I was doing. There's a lot of legal issues around derivative works. I didn't want anyone to think I was trying to pull a fast one or trying to make their life more difficult because there are plenty of people out there illegally benefiting from these things. Mm -hmm. um, and they all told me, oh, it's very interesting, but I don't care. Um, you know, we don't see an opportunity there. But if you want to try, go ahead. And if our lawyers bother you, let us know. And we'll, we'll get them to stop bothering you <laughs> for a little while. Ask for forgiveness, not permission-ish. Uh, yeah, I actually, I did ask, I didn't ask for permission. I went and made a statement that I'm doing this so that they didn't hear it from someone else, mm -hmm. you know, basically. And that, that was over a year and a half ago now, those first conversations. And, and frankly, the entire world has changed since then. And in terms of people understanding the value of derivative works, their inability to stop it, why, helping people understand why they shouldn't bother spending $100,000 a month on anti-piracy when, in fact, they could be making $200,000 a month, uh, bringing revenue in. So, uh, and in many ways, it's almost like the conversation we're having already with early streaming was too early. Mm -hmm. This earlier, even a year earlier, would have been possibly too early. Yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I, got, I think I got him right at the right time mm -hmm. because it took us several months to start to develop the tech. And, and then it took a while to determine actually what the business model would be. I mean, it's easy for me to say like, oh, I'm going to go fix the ecosystem for, for remixing. But then how, you know, how's that really going to work is, a, is another, another question. And I settled on the Steve Jobs 99 cent song line of thinking, which is make it as easy as possible. Non-negotiable, everything's the same. If people aren't ready to do business on those terms, I'll get to them later. And... Uh, uh, we finally started signing labels in, in March. And, um, you know, by that time, everyone's ready. You know, the, uh, the major labels would love to see us succeed. Um, whether we're the big winner or a competitor, you know, they may sit and watch. Uh, but they know there's revenue here and growth there. So being an innovator means being a little bit early, getting laughed at sometimes. Uh, in music, it's particularly difficult. And the reason is recorded music is not a good business. Live music is a great business now. You know, when I was young and working at Wax Tracks Records and came FDM would get ready to go on tour, they needed tour support from the label. The tours lost money and labels would loan bands money to go on tour so that records would be sold. 
To create awareness and yeah. support and it's community. A, it's completely and... the opposite now. Recorded music really only exists in service of of the live business and other other revenue streams from a financial standpoint. So trying to raise money uh, to build a digital music business is very difficult. And it's it's understandably difficult. If, picture if you're a tech investor and you have a choice of investing in uh, a company like Twitter who pays no royalties for all the content that's created. Whenever someone writes a tweet, uh, Twitter makes money from it, but not the person who wrote it. Wrote it, or, or a music company where seventy cents of, out of every dollar goes right back out the door. Um, you have to really love music, and you have to really believe in the scalability of a yeah, music. Yeah, make building. it up in scale. Yeah. It's so funny. There's an old Saturday Night Live sketch about a bank that only makes change. Uh, you know, if you bring us a dollar, we can give you four quarters or ten dimes, whatever you want. How do we make money? Volume. Mm. <laughs> uh, and that music reminds me of, of the same thing. You can do it. There are people, you know, streaming is tough. Uh, the economics, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, the econ Spotify's economics don't work. And it's not their fault. Streaming subscription music at nine ninety nine, the economics do not work. Um, Unless you have some other thing, a la maybe Amazon, yes. where you're, you're having it's it a feed the rest of the beast. Yes. Or Walmart, back yes. to the Walmart comment uh, earlier. And, and, and really, music started to get devalued, not because of file sharing, but because Best Buy started selling CDs in the early 80s below cost as a way to get you to walk past a vacuum cleaner. Um, and so uh, music has a long history of being used uh, by the electronics and, and hardware business, and you used to buy records at hardware stores, um, uh, being a loss leader, you know, to get foot traffic in through a store. And uh, so you've got Spotify, who's standalone. I think that's going to be really, really hard to make that work. Apple doesn't really care about music. They care that you love your phone. And, and we'll buy the next one. Right. And then it doesn't catch fire. Uh, hopefully not. And although I've always said when I was a smoker, I really wished my, my phone had a lighter on it. Um, but the, the, for Apple, it's a loss leader towards lo getting people to love their phone. For Amazon, it's going to be a loss leader towards just, you know, prime membership. Um, because as a standalone business, the economics currently just simply don't work. So you've been an innovator in different ways at different times. What's been your biggest surprise? It's an interesting question. I've been wrong about a lot. I don't want to sound. I don't want to say I'm surprised when I'm wrong. I'm surprised. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised uh, by a lot of things. Um, I didn't think. Um, I didn't think YouTube would be as big as it it was. I mean, when I first saw people uploading cat videos and videos of guys falling off garages, um, I didn't see it. Um, people who started it knew damn well that it wasn't for home videos of guys falling off the garage. It was for bootleg videos of The Daily Show and that, that that's what they were really building. Uh, but I didn't see that, you know, clearly at that time. Um, uh, I think a pleasant surprise, really a recent pleasant surprise was to, to have the RIAA say that recorded music business is up eight and a half percent this quarter. That is that is incredible. Um, and actually, if you look at the labels numbers, you can see that in, in everyone's statements mm -hmm. as well, that you're really seeing the lift become a lift. Yes. It is still a nominal lift compared to how much money has exited the industry. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's a horrible statistic that 80% of all professional songwriters in Nashville can no longer make a living as songwriters. Um, but it's nice to see some growth uh, in the space. Creators need need the revenue, or they don't get to create. I don't want to live in a world. Could you imagine if all television was reality television? Uh, I personally like professional entertainers, um, and I'm going to pay for them. And I feel the same way about music. And if 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 artists can't make a living, they're not going to spend time crafting incredible work. The Beatles certainly would have never made Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band if they had to have day jobs. Uh, and so I'm glad to see that revenue, uh, you know, growing. Um, I think that there's still a lot of room to move people to subscription streaming. Uh, in my experience, um, subscription streaming is something people are willing to pay for after they graduate college. Uh, and it's not just because they have money. Um, 
and uh, uh, in all deference to your students, I've always joked that if you can reach a beer or a bong from where you're sitting, you're not going to pay for music. And later, when you've got to take your kids to soccer practice and you don't want to spend time stream ripping or bit torrenting, then you're going to start paying. And so paying is an age thing, really. Mm -hmm. um, and getting someone to spend actually $120 a year is about the equivalent amount of money the average super fan of music was spending on CDs in the 80s and 90s. It's significantly above the average fan. Yes, was spending absolutely. spending half that maybe yes, at the peaks. exactly. And so if we can move a lot more people over there, and I believe we will as bandwidth increases all over. I mean, there's still limited places where the bandwidth works well enough on cellular networks, you know, to support that kind of thing. But as that all happens globally, I, I do believe there'll be a bigger pie, you know, for, for everyone to share. But a bigger pie does, still doesn't fix the fact that the, econo the, the one customer at a time economics of the streaming services don't work. Um. Anything else you see coming up the pike or that needs to come up the pike? You're working on an intractable problem now. Are there other problems or other things that you see that are frictions that need to be worked on? And any, maybe a couple entities that you see working on things that you find interesting or exciting? Um, I, I'm really interested in um, basically robot-generated music right now. Um, AI-generated? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think there's something there. It's at one end of a spectrum that interests me. I think making stuff is uh, part of being human. I think if we can lower the barriers to entry for music creation for people, um, that that's going to have value in, in people's lives. So I think Smule is doing really fascinating things with music creation on mobile devices. Um, uh, I thought Rock Band and Guitar Hero were really awesome. You know, at the time, it didn't surprise me that the the rejuvenation of those brands didn't go so well recently. Um, I think Native Instruments makes amazing products. Um, for years, I was an Ableton user, and I've been shifting over to the the Native Instruments products uh, for for music creation uh, that I really really enjoy. So I think, I, to me, it where the next level of innovation is going to happen is not around superstars and top 40 and how do people get their rihanna fix it's it's really around creation monetization and distribution for um uh the not yet famous uh musician uh that i think there's still uh, plenty of interesting you know work to be done i think on the consumer side uh uh Discovery has become a, a problem, and I see discovery very differently. I'm sure you're familiar with this buzzword, mm -hmm. and I don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is it was invented by music nerds working at tech companies. And the reality is most people are not music nerds who work at tech companies. They don't need to or even want to hear about 10 new bands a month. They don't even want to hear two new songs a day. The average person wants to hear what they love. And the, the music business, the digital music business focused a lot on newness, which I think is a real problem. If you go to the front page of Spotify, uh, for a long time, it was all new releases. We did the same thing when I was at Napster and at, and at Music Now. And it felt wrong because 99% of the time when you choose to hit play, you're going to hit play on something you've heard before. That's just how it works. And so subscription services have gotten better at focusing on what do you want to listen to right now. And lifting the library and making yes. it much more apparent. Yes. It's almost like the Netflix model where the Netflix model was trying to move you from new releases to here's all the things you should love that are part of what people like you have been listening exactly. to. Exactly, yeah. Uh, now, Discovery is has a different challenge, which is the crap ratio of music has gone through the roof. Uh, when I was a young person and I owned a house label, if there were 100 new 12 inches in the record store, that week in house music, that was a lot of records. But it only meant I was competing with 99 other records if I put one out that week. When I left Beatport, it was 27,000 new singles a week. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, the interesting thing is about the marketplace is I only like 1%. Uh, most people probably only like 1%, but we all like a different 1%. So I'm not saying throw it all out. Um, I like the idea of 
uh, everything being there. But uh, as a listener, I need great ways to find just, you know, to, to cut through all that crap. And you as someone also then helping create a marketplace in it to help them find the great stuff out of that and track it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, monitor really the user's behavior so that you can help them find, you know, more later. But the fact of the matter is my mom has a subscription and I think she's still just listening to Rick Astley, you know. Um, she's and, Rick rolling herself. She, oh, she does. Yes, she doesn't even know what that means. Uh, but I remember buying her the Rick Astley record in the '80s. She was so excited to get it. She thought he was so cute, and I'm sure she's still listening to it. But now on Spotify, she doesn't need a new record. So we've covered a lot of things about innovation. Anything you want to comment on as kind of a closing comment? Uh, no, thanks for having me. This was a really uh, enjoyable conversation. You are on it. I hope we get to talk again. I hope so and, too. And I'm um, looking forward to speaking to your students. Sounds great. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at Innovation dot school of music dot ucla dot edu join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music thanks again